Hi, everybody. It's nice to be in person again. I've like, given lots of talks in my living room to Zoom. Now there's like people who laugh and heckle. Got some good heckling, Paul? There we go. Look at that interactivity. So uh, I usually give talks about Dask. I've talked about Dask for a long time. They talk about deploying Dask, which is like the least fun part of Dask. Get, get prepared. And it's motivated by this conversation I have a lot these days. So I wear two hats. I maintain Dask. I also help to work in a company. It's about Dask called Coiled. And my conversations look like this. I say to you all, use Dask. It's easy. It's fun. And then you say, I love Dask. Go Dask. That's what you all say all the time. Uh, I then say, try Coiled. It's easy. It's cheap. And you say, I'll do this myself. Even cheaper. And that's just not, that's just not how companies work. Um, so I need to convince you that it's actually not that easy to deploy Dask, and this is what that talk is. So most of this talk, I'm going to be sort of with my normal open source hat on, and I'm going to be mostly focusing on this. It is actually not that easy to deploy anything, especially not a distributed computing system, especially not in Python, wherever it is you work in your company. So that's most of the topic of this talk. This talk, this is an iceberg problem, right? This is something that seems really easy at first. It's just borrowing a bunch of machines from the cloud, from Kubernetes, from your HPC machine. But actually a lot of crap underneath that iceberg. And so a lot of people like go into this saying, yep, I can get this done in a week. And it actually takes about a year. So this is a classic iceberg problem. And most of the talks are going to be me talking about the bottom of that iceberg to convince you that it's a challenge. Uh, and then we'll talk about some solutions that exist. I'll mention the one I get paid for, but also some others that exist in the ecosystem. So that's the talk. So again, in this talk, we will see first part a Dask example, because I find that if I show you a dashboard with pretty lights, I get your, the attention for the rest of the talk. Uh, then we'll talk about sort of that iceberg. We'll learn more about the problem. Uh, and then we'll talk about some solutions that exist. If I have time, I've got to set a timer. The timer's going. There's a clock there. Um, yeah, so let's start off with the Dask example. I also have like 100 slides here. This is new content for me, so we're going to see how this works. So this example, oops, no, that's not what I wanted. I like, so far. thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. Excellent work heckling. I've asked Paul to heckle throughout the conversation, by the way, because uh, again, Zoom was, was hard for all of us. Ooh, 100 slides. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So um, last week, I had a conversation. I actually had many conversations where people wanted to use XGBoost and hyperparameter optimization. I had like three in the same week, it was strange. So it's an issue. And I also had a conversation with Mike McCarty at NVIDIA, an old collaborator. So like, yeah, we've been working on this problem too. We're using XGBoost on GPUs with this library called Optuna. Optuna is a hyperparameter option framework that's pretty new. Not pretty new, it's pretty great, I should say. It's easy to use, super flexible. And so Mike was using it with, uh, so he's got some XGBoost code here, I don't understand. He's got some Optuna code down here. I also don't understand. And then in here, he uses Dask to like use Optuna many times. So it's cool. Good example of using Dask and XGBoost and Optuna all together. I wanted to try this out. One challenge, one common wart that we see with people using XGBoost and Optuna together is that you need to set up a database. So the very big, none of this matters for the rest of the talk, just an example. But uh, you need to set up a database. So the top of this notebook, Mike's colleague, is installing MySQL. And that just seems like a wart. And it's my job as a open source maintainer to make software that's a little bit smoother to use. I want to remove this need to have to set up a MySQL database in order to use these tools together. Fortunately, my other colleague, James Bourbeau, has a pull request that does exactly this. He has a pull request to Optuna that adds Dask support to make it easy uh, to do all that coordination work. You no longer need a database. Cool, I want to try it out. We're going to go and try that out together. And so I, sometime last week, I installed uh, James's work. So I like checked out Optuna. Also, the secret to this demo is a DAS demo. But secretly, there's a lot of deployment speed bumps we're going to run into. They were really smooth. We're going to see those same speed bumps throughout the rest of the talk. We're hitting the first one here. So I needed to install um, some software that my colleague James had written on my machine. And I downloaded it from Git. I installed it. It was good. I'm now asking for a cluster, and that's coming up. So what's happened here? I've taken my local software, and I've kind of like sent it up to the cloud somewhere. 
I've, I then provisioned 20 machines. That's me asking, in this case, Amazon Web Services, give me 20 machines, please. And Amazon sort of finds those machines for me. Now it's in the booting instance phase. All of those 20 machines are booting up. They're turning on, their operating systems are being loaded, they're connecting to the local disk, they're connecting to the network around them, and they've all switched. Now they've all started launching their software environments. They're launching the same version of Python I have locally, they're launching installing Dask. I actually have like development versions of Dask on my laptop, they're installing those versions. I have like edited things, they're installing those. They're installing XGBoost, they're installing Optuna, all the libraries that I need in order to run my experiment. Awesome. And they're going to do this for about a minute. So I need to find something interesting to talk to you for about a minute. Um, uh, Paul? There's another one. Make the font bigger. Make the font bigger, Natty says. Excellent job, Natty. Um, and now they're coming up. They're getting ready. Cool. So these machines are now at my behest. I have borrowed these machines from the cloud and set them up. I'm ready to go. I'm going to connect up to my DAS dashboard which of course you all love. This is why we're here, to hypnotize you. And I'm going to uh, use this. This is the new line that James added, this Dask storage. This is what we're testing to see if this actually works. We're gonna run uh, Mike's same code. I turned off GPUs, sorry, NVIDIA. Um, and yeah, now it's gonna work. So now we're like training a bunch of XGBoost models using Optuna on some machines that are rented in the cloud a couple of minutes ago. Right. This is like the thing that we all want to do. This is an easy, pleasant, smooth experience. How easy? You can get it done in a week, I'm sure. Um, uh, and so this is going to finish in about a minute. We're going to like wait a little bit, look at the flashy lights. And what's neat, oh, this actually is kind of taking a little bit long. I'm wondering why this is slow. This maybe should be a little bit faster. Let's dig into that in a second. First, we can see some results. I don't understand these results, but like maybe if you're a machine learning person, you do, and you can like get engaged in them. Cool. Like some of these parameters are more important than others, is what I've learned. Wait, this is slow. This, this felt slow to me. It should have been faster. We can pull up some profiling information. And if you're like familiar with Dask, you know how to interpret these plots. If you're everybody else, you don't. But what we learn is that this little bit right here, this part of this flame graph, this 3%, this is actually training the machine learning model. And this 97% is all overhead. And so there's something wrong with James's code. How awesome is it that I was able to experiment with this? And then actually, I sent James an email. James was actually on PTO last week. His like nanny quit. He had to do some, some like childcare. But I sent him an email anyway, because I'm that kind of boss. Um, I said, like, look, something's weird. Uh, here's a performance report. Like, you can go and look at the sort of the workflow that I just did, and you can see the same thing that I just did. I then like wasn't done, so 30 minutes later I kind of experimented around and like put a print statement into your code in this function and it printed out thousands of times. That line of code should not have run. You can go and download logs here. And so I can download some logs. James can go download some logs, he's on my team. And he can go and scroll down over here to the very bottom. And like this is all the crap that shouldn't be there. So again, this is showing you that things are broken which is the common state of the world. The world is broken far more often than it is correct. <laughs> and it's our job to rapidly unbreak the world as a team. So what I've just shown you is what I did last week to try to unbreak the world a little bit. So I'm gonna switch back to slides. We're gonna refer back to that example a few times, but we'll see a few of the things that I'm gonna talk about in that example. So now, part two of the talk, learn about the problem. Right, we're now to go to the iceberg and look at what's underneath the iceberg. We're talking about borrowing machines, which is kind of the top of the iceberg. We're gonna talk about installing software, network access, observability, and user and cost management. These are things that I see the most often. You might see totally different things. The iceberg is huge, or lots of icebergs. This is my version of the iceberg. So first, borrowing machines. I got 20 machines from Amazon in a couple of minutes. Cool, how did I do that? I can do that from lots of different systems. So when you borrow machines, you usually say, I want 50 machines, they've gotta have 12 CPUs each, and 100 gigabytes of RAM, right? And you then send that little message off to whatever system it is that you have in your company that borrows machines, to, that lends machines to you. Uh, this might be something like Kubernetes. On the right, we've got Kubernetes, a Dask operator spec. 
might also be some weird cloud API. This is the Amazon EC2 Fleets API, which we use internally at Coiled. Uh, it might also be uh, you know, some HPC job scheduler batch script. But in general, in all these cases, you know, Dask provides APIs that translate, I want this many machines, this many CPUs, this much memory, to whatever the underlying system that manages your machines and lends them to you. Dask does that. We're actually pretty great at this. I think we're the only system that does this to like every possible system you can think of. Uh, no matter what system you have, Dask can run on that system. If you have a system that Dask doesn't run on, that isn't like only use the head of your organization, I will buy you a beer. Um, <laughs> as an example, here are some projects that possibly cover what you want to do for like old Hadoop systems, Yarn, Mesos, if you're in that decade. Um, <laughs> All of the clouds, sorry, Mesos. People, that Mesos was great. Everyone loved Mesos. It just like didn't, whatever, I don't know, CloudRare didn't adopt it. DigitalOcean, Hetzner, I didn't know Hetzner existed. Uh, every HPC job scheduler, uh, SSH, if you're into that, MPI, like DAS can deploy on that thing. But this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? This is just borrowing machines. But even this is pretty complicated, right? Like it's not just CPUs and memory and disk. It's can I have fast disk? Can I have GPUs? You actually have like the cheap kind of GPU or the expensive GPU or the thing that NVIDIA has only said ten, whole sold 10 of. Uh, can I have spot pricing in this region? But actually spread across as many availability zones as possible because like some zones have more spot than others. It gets really complicated really quickly if you have users who are somewhat sophisticated. And these things may actually make like a significant difference in your cost uh, overall. There's like very fine differences you can do that have very strong effects in what you're running with. Uh, many people go the Kubernetes route. My experience is that Kubernetes is great for like the small, medium, large case, but it gets kind of weird when you start to try to model out all the different options you might consider. Um, so you can, but it's like tricky. Um, so that's like part one. That's the tip of the iceberg. Now I'm going to go into other deeper things. Also, just to harken back a little bit to the notebook, Let's go back over here. We saw me asking for machines here. And I wanted 20 workers, no, two CPUs each. I actually specified also the things like spot and spot on demand fallback, because I care a little bit about price. So this is me specifying the recipe. That's kind of what we saw in the example. Deeper in the iceberg, the second problem people run into is installing software. This is like very painful often. Um, so what does that mean? On my local machine, I had Jupyter Notebook running on this laptop. I like asked for a bunch of machines on the cloud. I had some software on my local machine. I needed to get that software out onto some wire and then out onto all of my DAS workers. Something needs to provide that process. This depends, this varies strongly based on where you are. Uh, and actually, there's a lot of different parts of this. You need to have it sort of the very top. You've got sort of like the base level of your operating system which evolves very slowly. And at the bottom, you've got things that evolve very quickly, like the individual Python functions that you're running. And there's a lot of stuff in between. Now, we often think about our software as being conda packages and pip packages, and that's true, but it gets weird. Sometimes you've got private pip packages. Sometimes you've got things in private GitHub. Sometimes you have things that are locally editable. Sometimes you have things that aren't conda packages, system packages. Sometimes you have little Python scripts. And if you're supporting users of any variety, you're going to really need to do all of these things. There are a couple of interesting projects I'm going to point out here which try to solve this problem in particular. That's Conda Store from the nice folks at Quantstack, a Quant site, apologies. Um, heckle, come on, Paul. What do you got? <laughs> Nothing? Yeah, Quant site. Um, and Prefix, which actually came out of Quantstack. Aha, that's why I said that. Um, <laughs> Prefix is a new company made by the Mama developers. I recommend people check, check them out. It's a really cool, really cool developer group. Uh, so, if you're on an HPC system, this is all handled through a network file system. So if you have a computer that was built like more than a decade ago, you're actually totally fine. Like NFS systems are beautiful, they handle all of this perfectly, it is magic. <laughs> like, I, I know this is, uh, I, I hearken back, or if I see someone who's like working at like an old research scientific lab, I'm like, yes, you do not have this problem, it is all handled for you by some beautiful network file system software. If everybody else, you probably use Docker, which is like, yeah, it's a small amount of magic, <laughs> right? Um, 
this works. Docker is great. It's an amazing technology. You can like build a Docker file locally. It'll work remotely, irregardless of the platform. Um, it sometimes sucks to like edit your Docker file to install a package and then like mount your local like directory you're working from into the Docker image, then like push out and you got to do a build and a push. Um, that's that's a bit challenging. Uh, Docker was built for stability in mind, and a lot of data folks actually really value dynamism. <coughs> And there's a kind of a tension here between these two things. Uh, we saw this in my notebook, right? Like I, I installed some stuff from Git into my local machine. I then like edited that code and added a print statement. I then asked for a cluster and everything came up, right? Like my system saw I had locally edited packages. It built wheels for me. It shipped those wheels out to my workers. This is the kind of dynamism that actually really helps to accelerate work especially if you want to sort of work with something that's, that's broken, which all of our software is. Uh, so uh, we have these different stacks. Most IT groups think of this problem as just sort of the top of this stack. I'm going to take some Conda packages and make some Docker images, and then we'll be good. Uh, these are also really important, especially if you have sort of like data science teams trying new things. I encourage you at least like be aware that this problem exists. Uh, this is still a super open problem. The like thing I showed you in Coil is also super broken. Like this is a Wild West problem. Uh, this is not solved. So moving on, point number three. We've talked about borrowing machines. We talked about installing software. Now we're talking about network access. This is really boring. Uh, also probably not important to most folks unless you care about security, which you maybe should, but not for a while. So uh, Dask is a scheduler. It's got some workers. You got your local machine. You connect to that machine. Probably with a command like this, you say client, you give it the address of the scheduler, you go ahead. If you do this today and there's a TCP in front of that protocol, that connection is not secure. So it is unsecure. Someone else can go and connect to that same scheduler. I have never, in like eight years of my life working on Dask, ever seen this happen. There aren't people like trolling the internet looking for Dask schedulers, but they could. And your IT department cares about this. Uh, and so there's like various solutions to this. The best solution today in open source is probably Dask Gateway, which like hands security keys to all the players in a nice way so that they can talk to each other either through the Dask Gateway or independently. It can, it can sort of broker conversations rather than proxy them. Dask Gateway is great. Recommend trying it out. Um, this requires also that you have like some other system allows everyone to trust Dask Gateway. There's like a, there's a, there's a continuous flow of trust that needs to happen here. There's some sort of auth system that needs to exist. And this allows for you know, us to talk to our Dask clusters, but not some other user talking to our scheduler, or some other worker trying to like sneak into the Dask cluster to siphon off some, some data, or some other Dask gateway trying to masquerade as a Dask gateway that we connect to and trust. Right? There's like lots of ways in which this can go bad. You know, this is all connected to your user database, which you'll need to hook into. If you're doing like the pure open source route, you're probably like installing Jupyter Hub or something. We see a lot of people using Dask Gateway and Jupyter Hub deployed somewhere with a DNS record, and that like seems to work out okay. You can get that to work. If you care about security, you need at least that. If you like work in an IT department place, you have other solutions to this. But something you need to think about. Um, you, I like people use security as like a scaremongering tactic. I, I genuinely think that most people don't need this. You can get pretty far not caring about this. You shouldn't. You like should protect your data, but many people don't and they're okay. You should like try Dask without caring about this too much. And then you should care about it. Then you should pay us money. Everyone who's like running companies is laughing in the crowd. <laughs> Am I wrong, Joe? Uh, okay, yeah, okay. Point number four, observability. So stuff broke, what happened? Uh, we saw this, right? I like told James stuff broke. I sent him a thing, this thing may be slow. I had to communicate to him what was broken. And I sent him things that he could look at after the fact. After Dask was done running, he could still look at, see historically what had happened and what was broken. Uh, and that was really critical to us fixing the problem. It's worth noting that we fixed the problem. Right, like we've been engaging with the Optuna folks, and as of nine hours ago, they're in Japan, they're asleep now. Like, they're pretty happy with how things are going. So, like, we've been able to resolve a lot of these issues because we have all of these tools around us. That's what allows us to move quickly. 
So, stuff broke, what happened, observability. I just did that, uh, thanks slides. Um, I'll talk about a few different things. Logs, logs is the easiest thing. You should have logs stored somewhere. Uh, commonly people say my DAS broke, I get this all the time. I wanna ask what happened, right? Another common uh, case, you know, I just, this conversation happened two weeks ago with a major customer of ours. I said like, look, you have a lot, a lot, of, you have a lot of issues. We fixed a lot of those issues. Actually, I had this conversation just earlier today, um, like looking at a group of people, yeah. Uh, <laughs> not, I, <laughs> you should upgrade. Like we've already fixed everything that's broken. Um, and said, but, but current workflows might break. This is a super serious problem. Like, well, you should have like a development version and a prod version. You just swip back and forth between them. That'd be good. They don't have that, unfortunately. Not the folks in the room, but like other folks, the generic folks. And so I'm like, great, okay. So if you don't have dev and prod, like let's assess all of your active workloads. Let's just see what's going on and we can make a judgment call, right? We shouldn't leave things broken for some users who need things to upgrade because we're breaking other users. We should make a, a, a well-informed judgment. So they assess everything and say, how would we do that? They have like no visibility into how things are actually running. Uh, and that's actually really tricky. They actually cannot move forward without that observability. So they can't make decisions, right? Telemetry informs decision making. And this is really important. Uh, this is what you need sort of in that bottom of the iceberg. Uh, fortunately, DAS provides a, a very large amount of telemetry. I was searching through the right word that was like a little bit swear wordy, but not too much. I decided with really large. DAS provides a lot of a, a lot of telemetry. The very basic thing is logs. DAS is a process. It dumps logs to standard out, standard error. You should put those logs as an aggregation service. It might be CloudWatch. It might be Datadog. You should then also this sounds silly, but like make it easy for your users to access those logs. Surprisingly, surprisingly uncommon. Um, Dask also, like if you use the Dask dashboard, you know the Dask tracks a ton of information. Like we actually have to track this information in order to do our jobs of scheduling your workload. We know every line of code that you've run, how long it's taken. We know every transfer that you've done. We know every line of code you've like submitted. Uh, we know every file that you've touched. Like there's a ton of information inside of Dask if we can capture it. It's too much information to save all of it. It's ephemerally visible in the Dask dashboard, uh, but we can save some parts of it. And that's actually, I think, a big space for opportunities, especially as large organizations try to optimize across the organization. Uh, a very simple way of doing that, this is like not my favorite way, but it's a good way, uh, is Prometheus. Prometheus is a very standard technology for observability and telemetry. Dask has been publishing Prometheus metrics for years. You probably have some system in your organization that is tracking Prometheus metrics. You should point it at Dask. Uh, and you can like get lots of interesting things coming out of it. It's not as good as a dashboard, but it's, it's useful. Uh, we've actually at Coiled found a lot of very interesting performance improvements that we've been able to achieve by using this. Uh, great, so telemetry saves lives. Okay. Uh, using cost, I'm gonna move, yeah, we're working on time. So, uh, using cost, or I think the, the most common way this occurs is that I shut everything down, and am I really, really sure about that? Uh, uh, actually, wait a minute, going back to my, my notebook, like, I never closed this, I am still wasting money. At the bottom of this, I had this cluster close thing, I should probably go press that. It's okay, I burned like a buck, <laughs> right? That's not a big issue. What's it is an issue if I leave it on for like three weeks and then IT comes and is like, hey, do you, do you still need these instances? Right, can I ask like show of hands who's had that experience? Yeah, like a lot of us have had that experience, right? Coiled actually would have like cleaned this up after 20 minutes of me not touching it. So like I've learned to just like not actually care, which is, which is nice. Uh, Jacob Tomlinson, the like probably deployment czar in the DAS community thinks this is the, the scariest problem we have today. It's very hard to actually try something in the cloud because you're afraid you're not gonna clean it up. And that's, that's challenging. So, um, this, is the, like, this is the question. So, um, I'm actually gonna show some images here. So, you should be able to answer these kinds of questions, right? How much money am I spending over time? What actually is occurring broadly? You probably wanna attribute that to various people, right? 
who in my group is spending time at which point, are they using things efficiently? Are they just like turning on GPU clusters and not using them? You probably want to like limit their ability to spend money, right? Uh, these are all things you probably want to do. Um, not at the start. This is like an iceberg problem. Like when you're a little bit deeper on, you'll care about these things. Not when you're getting started. Okay, so I scared you with the iceberg. There's like way more of the iceberg to talk about, but I've got seven minutes left, so I'm not gonna talk about any more. Instead, I'm gonna talk about solutions. I'm gonna go through a few. I'm gonna talk about mostly two or three. Uh, talk about Nabari, uh, previously called Qhub. I'm gonna talk briefly about Saturn and about Kubeflow. I asked for slides from all of those people who were sort of active. Uh, Nabari slides were the best. We're gonna spend the most time on Nabari. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about Coiled. So, um, yeah, back to these things. There are also some big companies have Dask solutions or like Dask parts of their solutions. I have yet to find someone who uses them and likes them, but they exist. So if you're on IBM or GCP or Azure ML, you could also try out their Dask thing. Uh, but I recommend actually other folks instead. So QHub, been around for a long time, comes from Quantsite. It was renamed to Nabare. Uh, it's great. Uh, it is a bunch of tools, Jupyter Hub, Prefect, Argo, Dask, Conda, Conda Store, Jitsi Video Chat, I hadn't heard of before, but there's a lot of tools that are all bundled together and you can use them as a platform. It also has Dask, which is why I'm talking about it. Um, Nibari, it's really hard to deploy this stuff. Uh, Nibari uses infrastructure as code or GitOps. If you're familiar with that, that sort of concept. You have a big YAML file. You specify a bunch of things. They turn that YAML file into Terraform, which then gets deployed to your cloud of choice or an on-prem version. They also kind of work on HPC sometimes. And that turns into a running, uh, running deployment. Nibari is doing a tutorial on Friday at I think 11 a.m. I recommend going to them. It's a cool platform. I talk to lots of users that have a good time with it. I recommend checking it out. I mentioned a few of their things. So there's many tools in Nabari, I mentioned a few. One is Conda Store. Conda Store attempts to solve the installing software problem. So you specify a Conda environment, pip requirements file, and makes Docker images for you. Those became available to Dask. Those become available to Jupyter Hub. Uh, sometimes people don't want to code in Jupyter. It's nice to have a system that you can write in other ways. So Nabari also supports, supports things like VS Code. You can use like an actual IDE and Jupyter. That's nice to have that flexibility. And then things like dashboard deployment, model deployment, there's lots of things that come out there. So there's Saturn Cloud. Uh, Saturn Cloud is very much like Nabari. It is a set of tooling that all kind of works together. They're more AWS focused. Uh, in, in defense, so I'm actually gonna kind of slip, skip through these things just because Nabari slides were better and Saturn and Nabari are kind of similar. I gave Hugo Shi, the like owner of Saturn, relatively little time to make slides for me. So I apologize, Hugo, for skipping past some of this stuff. But Saturn is very AWS native. You can like go to the marketplace, you can hit a button, you can have Saturn running in your system. So that's, that's neat about it. Um, moving on, Kubeflow, kind of the same thing, uh, but instead of being AWS focused, it is Kubernetes focused, right? They've got a big set of tools that they find are really commonly used in ML. Just like Nibari has a set of tools they find are really commonly used in data stuff. Um, Kubernetes has like a whole jungle of tooling to solve all the problems I mentioned. It's hard to find the right tools, and so Kubeflow is like an opinionated set of those tools you can install. They're very Kubernetes forward. Recently, actually there was a blog published today by Jacob Tomlinson, uh, Dask developed a Dask operator. Uh, which is like a much more native way of using Dask on Kubernetes. If you're using Dask on Kubernetes today, I recommend checking out the blog. I think it was tweeted from the Dask Dev Twitter account this morning. Uh, no, let's get past this. Okay, Coiled, I got three minutes, but I'm a for-profit hat. Do you have a for-profit hat for me? Yes, one second. Yes, come on, throw it over. I'm now taking off my open source hat and putting on my for-profit hat. <laughs> Okay, so I, I'm gonna steal Nabari's slides, right? So Nabari has all these things. You know, Saturn has a different set of things. I'm gonna keep the same slide. Kubeflow, same thing. Coiled, not so much, right? Coiled is mostly just Dask in the cloud. We do far, far less for you. We only do Dask, but we do it really well. What we actually really care about, though, is about working outside to other things. Coil does not provide notebooks, but I, from my laptop, connected to Coiled, 
right? Like this is not a coil notebook. This is on my machine. I like typed in Jupyter Lab on my machine and then imported coil and made a coil cluster, right? So we try very hard to run anywhere that Python is run. We look at that space. We create as similar space as we can in the cloud and we connect you to that system smoothly. So if you want to use coiled from like GitHub Actions, it's trivial. If you want to use coiled from Prefect, it's trivial. If you want to use coiled from our studio, it's trivial if it runs Python. Um, anywhere you can run Python, you can run coiled. Um, so we, you can run VS, VS Code. I run it from Vim. I run it from my Python. Uh, coiled just focuses just on Dask. We try not to provide a platform. We try to provide Dask as well as possible. That allows us to really, really focus on making the Dask experience smooth. So there are like 50 different things I could talk about, about the little small paper cuts that we solve. I'm going to focus on three. One, setup. Two, software. Three, costs. These may be like the biggest pain points that we hear in order. So setup, if you have a laptop and you have AWS credentials, you can do this, and you'll have a Dask cluster running. So uh, you can authenticate with GitHub, Google, or Passwords, you can like log in in the next 10 seconds. Uh, you can deploy, so Coil deploys in your cloud. We do not manage computation for you. Instead, we manage your cloud account on your behalf. You give us enough permissions to like press all the buttons in your cloud account, and we press those buttons just right. Um, I don't know how, to, I like never log an AWS console. Uh, I use like a config file locally. Um, I'm just gonna like ls. If you have this, you can ask Coil to manage your cloud account. And this works about, with about 70% of credentials that we found. About 70% of people who try running Coil set up AWS, looks at their credentials, sets everything up, takes a few minutes. You have to trust us a little bit, not too much. We don't look at your data. We just like set things up for you. And then, yeah, we run anywhere, anywhere you run Python. And we're super configurable, right? So like you have machines, you can have like lots of weird, crazy configurations. You can ask for anything you want from the cloud, and we set that up smoothly for you. You can also like, support other colleagues who don't have those credentials. There's a whole team management system I won't talk about at all. So that setup and composability is easy to use from anywhere. It's pretty easy to get started. I think it's the easiest platform to get started with, but I'll let you make that judgment. Two, software. We saw this earlier. So Coiled has a way to like make Docker images from Conda environment files. So you can like, you can either give it a Docker image, or you can give it like a Conda environment YAML spec. Uh, honestly, this kind of sucks. Like, I actually really hate building Docker images remotely somewhere. It's like the Conda solve problem, but now it's remote. So it's actually like even harder to debug. Um, uh, and it like takes a while, it's like not fun. Um, I, I showed you in the demo this package sync thing, uh, which like just like scrapes your local environment and tries to recreate it. This is actually also very buggy. This fails in lots of cases, but it's still way better than anything I've seen before. It's actually a really smooth experience. Uh, kind of related to this, uh, we also do like credential transfer. Like if you've got credentials locally and you want to access remote data, we like see what credentials you have. We like make secure tokens. We ship this off to all the workers in a safe, secure way so you can access data remotely. We try very hard to mimic the like local experience at scale without actually getting in the middle. And that's an interesting dance that we, we try to do. It works well for me. Uh, three, I'll mention costs. Uh, people care about money, as what I've, what I've learned running a company. Uh, this is a, sh a, dev a display of, I think, our own account uh, running benchmarks on Dask. And what you're seeing is blue, I think, spot availability, and orange is on-demand availability. We have like weird policies. You can ask for spot instances, which are like three times cheaper. Uh, but if there aren't enough, we will like give you on demand. And then we'll like, if the spot instances go away, we'll like smoothly exit them from the cluster. Right? We actually like handling this dance very nicely actually is a significant reduction in costs. We're doing this because we know coil, we know the cloud, we also know Dask. We can do both of these things in tandem quite well. As one example, I showed you all the plots before about observability. We can tell you what you're doing. Uh, it's also free, kind of. Uh, we don't really start charging you until we would charge like $1,000. So about 10,000 CPU hours at that point per month, we start charging you. Before then, it's free, but you still have to pay your cloud provider. Again, we're just like pressing buttons on your behalf. We can't make Amazon not pay, not charge you. So 
those are the things I want to talk about. Zooming back out, Dask is pretty easy. Deploying it is sometimes easy, but not always. There's an iceberg in here. Um, also in summary, use Dask. It's great. Also consider using a platform. Uh, you will eventually need the things that I just talked about. You could use Coiled, you could use Nabari, you could use Saturn, you could use QHub, uh, you could use Kubeflow, you could use something else, but like be aware you'll need these things. You go to das.org and call .io. Finally, I'll mention there's some Dask related talks I want to call out. Uh, there's Apache Beam on Dask from Alex. Yep. There's testing big data applications from the few guys, not in the room. Uh, there's scaling Python uh, from the Quantsite folks. They like worked with Dask to, on a lot of banking applications. Uh, I'll be with Dask tutorial with David and Natty on Thursday, and right after that, there's a Nabari tutorial if you want to use their platform. Thank you all for your attention. I think we got about five minutes for questions. I also speak really quickly. And so there's no way everyone understood what I said. <laughs> Alex. Can you run the uh, like non Python languages on Dask infrastructure? Use that level of abstraction. Yeah, so the question is can I run non Python languages on Dask infrastructure? Dask runs Python functions on Python objects. Those Python functions can call other languages. Often we're running C, C, Rust, CUDA. Uh, there are no good APIs around Dask from other languages, though. They're like, was a Julia thing for a while. But maybe they answer your question. You got like C code, put in a Python function, you're good to go. Thank you. Diego. Uh, yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, Kubeflow, Saturn, and Nabari. Uh, what are some of the other things you guys are using that? Yes, the question is I made this claim that like Kubernetes is not great when you have a great variety of custom requirements on your architecture. Uh, you can definitely get it to work. And like Kubernetes folks in the room would like hound me a little bit. Uh, my experience is that like someone asks for GPUs. Great, make a separate GPU node pool. If you like make labels and you like annotate those labels, so the nodes go to the right node pool. You then need like SSDs. You make a different node pool with those. And you need to like, you're suddenly starting to like mimic the hierarchy of the underlying deployment infrastructure inside of Kubernetes with labels, with taints, with tolerations, with like lots of different Kubernetes infrastructure to do that. But you find yourself architecting a lot of that system inside of Kubernetes. It's like kind of remodeling the world. That's my experience. I found that to be painful. Uh, but there are other, I think Carpenter might be a thing that tries to get through some of that. There's like various Kubernetes solutions to some of that as well. There's a question to next, you have a question? I'm sorry, can you speak up? How easy it is to update the model after it's deployed in Dask? Yeah, so Dask mostly is used to process data, to train models. Uh, you can use it to do anything. Um, it's not usually like a serving system, though. That's not a common, a common application. Um, um, yeah, but you can like, you could very easily write new Python code and send that to Dask. Um, Dask is a very low level tool. Dask allows you to run Python code on different computers. The way in which you use that is up to you. Um, if you want, this is a good example, I can go to a good way to get started with Dask is to look at examples.dask.org. And there are a bunch of fun examples here. And one you might be interested in is like, uh, using a Dask to sort of back a web server complicate, computation. And this might be something similar to what you're describing, but I want to know more. I'm happy to chat afterwards. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Maybe one more question? Yep. Um, it was just beautiful when you were setting up, getting some computers, there was a beautiful little dashboard inside Jupyter. Yeah. And colors and boxes. What's going on there? Yeah, so that's, uh, this is not the right thing. Where would I go? You were talking about, Let's just do it again. How about that? Yeah, so uh, yeah, visibility, transparency, telemetry, understanding what's going on is super important, right? Even in just like the notebook experience, right? Knowing that, you know, if I was just waiting here for two minutes 
I would be nervous, I would be anxious, I would be having negative feelings. <laughs> but I know that they're provisioning, and I'm gonna see in like 10 seconds that they're gonna make progress, and that's gonna make me happy, right? <laughs> Super useful. Technologically, we're using a Rich to do this. So Rich is a great library, I recommend looking at it. Uh, textual is also very neat. You should all like go use Textual and Rich. Um, but yeah, I mean, just like information inside of users' eyes is good. That's probably a good point to stop on. Thanks for the question. Thank you all again.